Hi everyone, and welcome to Dead to Rights, the podcast. I'm your host, Donna Carrick. We're thrilled to bring you this May 20th, episode 21, titled Dr. Shediak, featuring the author of such exceptional thrillers as The Demeter Code, Canada's own Russell Parkway. We've got a terrific lineup coming down the pike over the next few weeks. On May 27th, it's our pleasure to bring you renowned host of the popular Conversations Live, Mr. Cyrus Webb. On June 3rd, we'll gain insights into writing and marketing a memoir from the author of Pieces of Me, Lisbeth Meredith. Lisbeth will reveal facts regarding her years-long search for her kidnapped children. On June 10th, we're honoured to speak with critically acclaimed UK author and master of the Middle Ages, Mr. Michael Jex, a historical mystery author of the Knights Templar series. Then crime writer Jennifer Berg, author of the Elliott Bay mystery series, will join us on June 17th. And on June 24th, we return to Canada for Canadian crime writer Dee Wilson, author of A Keeper's Truth. I hope you'll join us for these wonderful author talks and short story readings. As you may imagine, hosting a podcast like Dead to Rights is a labor of love. It's not for profit. It is intended purely to highlight and help profile some of today's most worthy, but perhaps lesser known authors and their works. It's also meant to bring writing, editing, and marketing tips to new writers, as well as to entertain listeners with our Readers on the Run short story segments. To keep Dead to Rights running smoothly, we need your help. No, we don't need money, but we do need our loyal and new listeners to do something very important for us. Please find our podcast, Dead to Rights, with your host, myself, Donna Carrick, at either iTunes or Google Play. Then, please subscribe. Because by subscribing, even if you don't always have time to listen, you will help to push our weekly podcast up in the official ratings so it can be discovered by more new listeners. And this is really critical to keeping a podcast alive. If you enjoy the podcast, please rate it. You can leave a review if you like, but if you don't have time to leave a review, please just leave a starred rating. It takes only seconds to do that, but it can mean life or death for a podcast like ours. There's been a lot of news during the past week. As is too often the case lately, it has not been good for the most part. Although we know that thoughts and prayers are never enough, still we can't help but send our love and care to the families in Santa Fe, Texas, this morning. Another tragedy on Friday, another round of frustration, argument, heated debates, and still the people cry for change. Change, change, change. It's one of those things that is never possible until it is. But there was a high point to the week. I'm not a monarchist, nor am I an avid royal royal watcher uh, by any means. But I have to admit that I did enjoy the wedding of Meghan and Harry. It was a bright spot in an otherwise bad news week. The beauty and the pageantry are one thing, and there was certainly enough beauty and pageantry to go around, make no mistake about it. But the bigger factor in my view was the potential of this particular marital union to permanently alter, for the better, the way we view race. The way we honor love over hate the way we move forward as a civilized society to become more inclusive, more equal, more elevated of love. Maybe that old British myth of fair play can become a reality. Maybe this can even happen in our lifetime. Who knows? I don't claim to have the answers to the world. I'm just a Canadian with a pen and a podcast, a writer and a publisher. But to quote the ever-quotable Bob Dylan, I do know one thing. The times, they are a-changing. Whether that change will ultimately be good or not remains to be seen. Before we head into our Readers on the Run segment for today, I want to tell you about a novella I'm currently reading. 
It's a fast, fun, light-hearted look at Canadian crime family titled The Bootlegger's Goddaughter by Canada's Queen of Comedy, Melody Campbell. If you need a chuckle or a good belly laugh, I highly recommend it. You may recall that we chatted with Melody Campbell on April 22nd for our podcast episode 17 titled Dog Trap. Melody hails from Hamilton, a.k.a. The Hammer, so she does know a thing or two about the royals of the underworld. As Melody would say, you can't change who your family is, but hey, you can laugh about it. So please pick up a copy of The Bootlegger's Goddaughter and laugh along with Canadian crime writer Melody Campbell. You won't regret it. And that, my friends, is a dead to rights guarantee. So now, before we start our interview with Mr. Russell Parkway of the Demeter Code, I'd like to offer our readers on the run a little story I wrote titled Dr. Shediak. This story first appeared in our 2014 Carrick Publishing Crime Anthology, World Enough and Crime. And later, it showed up in my collection titled North on the Yellowhead, also Carrick Publishing, 2016. For anyone who may be wondering about the meaning of the title, don't despair. Shediac, spelled S-H-E-D-I-A-C, is not a well-known place. It's one of those truly idyllic places on the Bay of Fundy, near Moncton, New Brunswick, from where my people hail. So please look it up. Google that. I think familiarity with a setting can really help a reader or a listener to attach more fully to a story. And now for our reading of Dr. Shediak by myself, Donna Carrick. Editor's note, and yes, I was the editor of this one. When a 30-year-old murder drags Detective Mallory Tosh back into a past she'd prefer to leave buried, She is forced to choose between childhood loyalties and adult conscience in the case of Dr. Shediak. Some mysteries are better left unsolved. Detectives aren't supposed to think that way. We're taught to uncover secrets, to desire the truth for its own sake. It's not our job to adjudicate, to navigate the intricacies of crime and punishment, Rather, to ask questions and follow evidence, and we are expected to do so without reason, purely for the satisfaction of reaching a solution. But we are human, after all. Almost every cop has, at one time or another, imagined a case through to its preferred conclusion, allowed himself to fantasize that he is judge and jury, that he knows best what the outcome should be. But I digress. I'm not here to explore the endless spectrum of evil deeds encountered by the average cop. I'm here to tell you about only one felony, and one outcome. I'll happily leave the greater world of crime for others to ponder, and focus instead on the death of a doctor. He died long ago. It's hard to say after so many years whether justice serves any tangible purpose. But that's not my concern. I'm a cop, not a philosopher. White sand scorched my fingertips. It was impossible not to gaze at the shimmering length of beach. I found my sunglasses in the pocket of my tailored cotton shirt and settled them onto my nose. Parley Beach, keeper of my earliest memories, both the good and the, well, less fortunate ones. I'd forgotten some of the details, like how damned hot the sand was, and how the roaring waves threatened to muffle all other sounds, except for the piercing squawks of overhead gulls. In one regard, at least, my memory had served me, The lacy trim of blistering sand really did stretch for miles. Where was he found? I stood and brushed my hands, opening my nostrils to the salty breeze. The young Mountie from Southeast Division, Shediac Detachment, straightened herself. Rayanne Blanchette was on the short side for a cop, but she had that strength of bearing they train into all new recruits, especially the females. 
There's a grassy knoll further up, well past the high water mark. Grassy knoll. I liked the phrase. I looked in the direction of her pointing finger and could just make out a tail of yellow crime tape fluttering above a ridge. She puffed her chest and started toward the scene. I hesitated, reluctant to leave the water's edge. If I hadn't been wearing my good Italian leathers and black wool pants, the crease freshened that very morning by the hotel's dry-cleaning service, I'd have been tempted to walk in the opposite direction. The frothy lure of the white caps was powerful. Instead, I turned and followed the officer. We crested the ridge, stepping over a short clump of bush. The scene was laid out before us. A handful of RCMP officers from the Cold Case Division in Fredericton milled around a trussed-up hole in the sand, about seven feet by five. As we approached, I could see it was deep, dropping approximately ten feet. "'He must have been near the surface, right?' I said, to no one in particular. A detective in scruffy-looking plain clothes extended his hand. We shook as he answered. He might have been planted as much as four or five feet down, he said. It would have been hard to go much deeper using a shovel without hitting packed dirt and rock. Tosh, I said, Mallory Tosh, Toronto PD. François Jobin, Fredericton, MCU. I have to say up front, I'm not here as part of the investigating team, I said. No worries. Blanchette filled me in. He nodded at the officer who'd accompanied me to the scene. She's with the Shediac Detachment, Southeast Division. I nodded. It had been Rayanne Blanchette who'd first contacted me through Toronto's 52nd Division when they found a small, thick, leather-bound journal nestled amongst the bony remains with my mother's name and childhood address printed on the final page. Blanchette had done the legwork, tracking my late mother and myself to the Little Apple, Toronto. A driver's license recovered from the burial site revealed the victim to be Dr. Jean-Paul Larue, a Shediac local who was reported missing in 1981. My mother's name might not have raised any questions, might have been mistaken for patient information, except for one thing. It was printed in black, firmly pressed ink, a tidy script that indicated frustration to the handwriting experts. Furthermore, her name had been underlined three times with an angry red pen, circled twice by the same red pen, and appeared in the calendar notebook on the day before his reported disappearance. To add a layer of damnation, a note had been scrawled by the same hand, also in red, under her address. Make her see reason! Exclamation point. It might not mean anything, but to the eyes of a detective it screamed of conflict. And since LaRue's skull had been brutally smashed in, Conflict seemed to be the word of the day. Blanchette hadn't given me much information over the phone. She had a long conversation with my boss, who advised me to fly to New Brunswick and offer my help as a civilian. My mother, Naomi Tosh, had kept close ties with her maritime family right up till her death in 2010. When we were little, Mom took me and my identical twin, Moraine, and much later our younger sister, Grace, down home every summer to be with her family. Our mother was a volatile woman, most often reticent and sometimes angry, who likely suffered from a bipolar disorder. The only time we ever saw her happy was during those summer visits. My father, Derek Moody, was a Toronto boy. They met in 1981 when Mom came to the city. They never married, but lived together in Wilson Heights area until he died in 2001. My father was difficult to live with. I can't say he was missed. Let's leave it at that. In my memory, Moraine and I raised each other. She was lovely, feminine, stylish, and demure, while I was the tomboy of the family. When Grace came along, we quickly took over her basic care, 
leaving our mother to tend to her own demons. Blanchette tells me you've offered to drive up to the Tosh farm with us, Joban said. When do you want to go? I asked. This afternoon would be good, before a word gets out. You know how quickly bad news spreads. He gave me a sideways look, and I hurried to say, Blanchette asked me to keep it to myself. I haven't contacted any of my relatives. Good. Since you're here as a civilian, I'll ask the questions. Of course. I'll make the introductions and let you take it from there. Jobin wasn't being a bully. He was following protocol. I had to be careful not to be perceived as inserting myself into the investigation. After all, my mother, Naomi Tosh, was the only POI we had at the moment. My capacity had to be strictly off the books. Having a cop on hand who knew the Tosh family well enough to encourage open dialogue, but not well enough to suffer from misguided loyalties, could prove useful for Jobin. I followed him to the parking lot. I'd rented a Focus, not much muscle, but great on gas. It had been more than 15 years since my last visit, and I wasn't sure I'd be able to find the farm on my own. I'll drive, Jobin said. We'll come back for your car afterwards. Good. It made sense, I had to admit, but I missed my Wrangler. When was the last time you were at the farm? Geez, it would have been sometime in the late nineties. My grandmother, Bessie Tosh, was still alive at the time. Was your mother close to the family? Yeah, very close. She brought us home every summer. Her oldest brother, George, took over running the farm. He still lives in the old house, along with his sister, my Aunt Zelda. Uncle John and his wife, Tilly, have a new house on the property. They have two grown kids about my age, Stacia and Robbie. I'm not sure where my cousins live. Any other cousins, aunts, or uncles? Not that I know of, at least not in the Shediac area. Mum did have a younger brother, Harold, but he died in the early 80s. She didn't talk about him very much. I stared out the window, watching the cottages of Vista Street give way to Gold Beach Road and on to Main Street, past the fried clam stands and the Shediac lobster shop. At Chapman Corner, we made a right, heading north. When we reached Bay Vista, Jobin hung a left onto 134. It rolled past forests and Acadian farms of varying affluence. Almost there, he said. Did your mother ever talk about Dr. LaRue? I don't think so. I gave the answer almost in my sleep. It hadn't been a long flight, but there was always a huge rigmarole at Pearson International, then renting a car in Moncton, hooking up with Blanchette in Shediac, not to mention being whacked in the face with the reality of Parley Beach, the flood of memories. Frankly, it had left me exhausted. Shit, I said, snapping awake. What? I just remembered something. It may not be relevant. Spit it out while it's fresh in your mind, he said. It's just something I overheard a long time ago. My Uncle John was in his cups. I think he was talking to my mother and Uncle George. What did he say? Jobin asked. Dr. Shediac. That's all. It was nothing. Just a phrase I remember. Dr. Shediac. Suddenly I was there in my mind. On the beach, skipping over the blistering sand with my sister Moraine. A pot of lobster was screaming over a fire, and the tables were set with butter, sugared lettuce, potato salad, maritime baked yellow eyed beans, and coleslaw. Dr. Fucking Shediac, my Uncle John said. Settle down, John, my mother had a worried look. Take it easy. Uncle George caught me in one arm and Moraine in the other, swinging us into a big bear hug. You girls go for one last swim. We'll be eating soon. He dropped us onto the hot sand and we squealed, drowning out the sound of the boiling lobsters. I hopped from one foot to the other and was about to race Moraine to the water when Uncle John staggered around the table, raised his beer in the general direction of a sandy ridge and said, Here's to Dr. Shediac! That miserable bastard. 
May he rest in peace. Johnny, knock it off, my mother said. You've had enough to drink. Tilly, did you bring coffee? Better heat it up. My mom grabbed the bottle from her brother's hand and emptied it onto the sand. Moraine and I ran, laughing, into the ocean. It didn't prove anything. Regarded in the context of a childish mind, it carried no weight whatsoever. Just the same, I rolled up my car window and crossed my arms over my chest. You cold? Joban said, closing his window. A little. I took a deep breath. What can you tell me about LaRue? He had a house on the outskirts of Shediac. Oh. Yeah, and in the early 80s he was the only doctor living in the area, he added. I thought about what that meant. He was a heart surgeon. He worked out of Moncton General. He left the hospital late one evening and never made it home. Anyone see him leave? Hospital staff remembered saying good night to him, Joban said. His car never left the lot. And that was in 1981, I asked. Yes, late summer. I did some mental math. My mother, Naomi Tosh, had moved to Toronto in the fall of 81. Moraine and I were born in late 82. Thanks to my twin's sudden death earlier that summer, my DNA was on file with the Toronto coroner's office. I quickly ruled out the possibility that Dr. LaRue might have been our father. My DNA had established that my younger sister, Grace, and I had the same father. LaRue was already dead long before Grace was born. Disappointed, I had to admit that Derek Moody was my biological father. As much as I might like to deny it, I carried that asshole's DNA. We're here, Joban turned into the winding driveway, parking close to the old house. The new place was visible on the other side of the field, a comfortable distance away. Aunt Zelda answered the door, looking a little heavier and a lot grayer, but otherwise exactly as I remembered her. Mallory, is that you, she said. She glanced from me to Joban and back at me, suspicion clouding her eyes. Hi, Aunt Zelda, I said. It's good to see you. What's happened, she said. Don't worry, Aunt Zelda, everything's okay. This is Detective Joban of the Fredericton RCMP. He just wants to ask a few questions, mostly about Mom. He asked me to come with him. She recovered herself pulling the door open and ushering us into the main parlor. "'When did you get home, dear? Did Gracie come with you? Have you seen your cousins yet? Your uncles? Oh, it's been so long. You must have so much news.' That was an understatement. Earlier that summer, my estranged twin, Moraine, who'd been missing for over fifteen years, had died. I'd learned she'd been living less than three miles from me, under the assumed name of Susan Baxter. And, wonder of wonders, Moraine, Susan, had a daughter. Carolyn Baxter, 15 years old, was the spitting image of her mother, and by extension, my own mirror image. My niece, Carolyn, was now living with me. So yes, I had news. But now was not the time to get into it. Aunt Zelda, I said, Detective Joban needs to ask some questions. Can I make tea while you and he have a chat? No, thank you, dear. I think you'd better stay with us. Her face darkened, and it was impossible to guess what she was thinking. She sat in her favorite straight-back chair, leaving us to sink into the overstuffed armchairs near the fireplace. Mrs. Joban began. Miss. Miss Tosh. I never married, Detective. But you can call me Zelda. That is my name. A defensive edge had crept into her voice, and my heart sank. Normally, Zelda was the most cheerful, unflappable person I knew. Because I was raised by an unpredictable mother and a violent father, Zelda was my rock, my proof that there were good, strong-minded adults, and that I could, by force of will, become like her. Zelda, he continued, I have to ask you about things that happened a long time ago. My memory is exceptional. I'm glad to hear it. Back in 1981, when your younger sister, 
Naomi, was still living here, how old would she have been? My aunt's eyes rolled upward, fixing on the ceiling for a moment. She was doing the math. I would have been twenty or twenty-one. Twenty, I think. So Naomi had just turned seventeen. Has your family always lived here? We've been right here, on this farm, for generations. So you would have known everyone around here. Most everyone, if they went to the Anglican church, or if they played bingo, or if they had kids that went to school with my niece and nephew, or shopped at our supermarket. Of course, a lot of folks around here are Catholic. I'd still know most, at least to see them. Do you remember a doctor, a heart surgeon who lived here in the 70s? He had a place near the shore, near Shediac Harbor. Zelda folded her hands in her lap, giving the question some thought. My doctor is in Moncton, she said. What was this fellow's name? Maybe I'll recognize it. LaRue, Jean-Paul LaRue. She kept her eyes on Jobin's face. That's a common name around Shediac, she said. He would have been in his forties then, a good-looking man, tall. Jobin reached into an envelope and pulled out a photo. It was aged, but still clear. It showed a handsome, stern-looking man with neat dark hair and black eyes. He held it in front of Aunt Zelda. She took the photo, mulling it over. I just don't know, she said. I might have seen him around, but I don't think I knew him. What about your sister, he said. Did Naomi see the same doctor as you, or did she ever mention a friend who was a doctor? If you mean was she dating him, Detective Joban, my sister was only a girl at the time. This LaRue was a grown man. My family would have put a stop to any funny business. No, I don't remember her ever mentioning a doctor friend. The back door opened with the same scream door squeal that I remembered, and my Uncle George called out, Zelda, is someone here? I saw a car out front. Yes, George, Mallory is here. She's with a detective from Fredericton. Zelda hopped up from her chair and headed for the kitchen, where George was washing up. My uncle was always careful not to bring dirt from the field into the house with him. Jobin followed Zelda to the kitchen, making sure she and George wouldn't have the chance to confer privately. Mr. Tosh, he said, holding out his hand, while George dried his. I'm Francois Jobin. We need to speak with you, as well as with your brother John. Is he here? He's finishing up in the barn, then he'll head over to the new house. I'll try his cell phone. He usually carries it when he's working, in case Tilly needs him. Uncle George made the call, and within five minutes my Uncle John was washing up in the same kitchen sink. I put on a pot of tea, notwithstanding Zelda's earlier rejection of the idea. I was embarrassed to note that Uncle John had been drinking. He wasn't far gone, but it was early in the day. I knew Aunt Tilly wouldn't approve, though with her good nature she usually took most things in stride. "'Mallory, my dear,' Zelda called in from her chair in the parlor. "'Would you make a pot of coffee as well? Your Uncle John doesn't care for tea.' "'Of course,' I said, forgetting my embarrassment as John winked at me. His sense of humor was contagious. I couldn't help but grin." Now that you're all here, Jobin said, we've had an incident over at Parley Beach. We found the remains of a fellow who's been dead for some time. I'm wondering whether any of you might know this man. He held the picture out again, and this time Uncle George studied it before passing it to Uncle John. Don't know him, George said. Good-looking fellow, John said, winking at me again, but can't say I recognize him. Was he from around here? Had a place in Shediac. I watched their faces, as I'm sure Joban did. Their placid brows didn't fool me for a moment. I couldn't guess what it was, but they sure as hell were hiding something. His name was Dr. Jean-Paul LaRue, Joban repeated for the benefit of my uncles, a surgeon out of Moncton General. What occurred to me at that point was that none of them, not Zelda, George, nor John, had asked the obvious question, what had happened to Dr. LaRue? Joban must have caught the omission as well, because he studiously refrained from offering any details. 
There's a LaRue old family I know of in Riverview, Uncle John said. They spend a lot of time over in Pointe de Chine. Haven't been to the Pointe in years, Joban said. I'll track them down. They might be related. He lifted his teacup, letting a momentary silence build. We cops know how to do that, to let the silence do the asking for us. With a suspect in hand, you never know how he or she will react to one line of questioning or another, but they all respond pretty much the same to silence. First, they twitch. Then their eyes begin to dart. This took place in a fraction of a second, my relatives glancing almost imperceptibly at each other before Aunt Zelda coughed. We didn't know this man, she said. More silence. I was sorely tempted to break it, just to make things easier on my aging relatives, but I knew better than to give in. Fella must have had enemies, John said. He took a long swallow of his coffee. Fella gets himself whacked. He caught himself, but too late to suck back his words. Joban looked at me, his eyes flashing. Whacked, he let the word out slowly. Yes, fellow gets whacked. He might have enemies. We don't know this Dr. LaRue, my aunt said, standing to let us know the visit was over. My brothers have been working in the field all day. It's time I got George some dinner, and Johnny, you'd best be getting home to Tilly. You know how annoyed she gets if you're late. Uncle George stood as well. He was a big man, taller even than Joban. How long will you be in town, Mal? he asked me. Are you staying for dinner? I can't tonight, Uncle George, but thank you. I left my rental car over at Parlee, and my niece, Carolyn, Moraine's girl, is waiting for me at the hotel. Moraine had a daughter? What are you talking about? my Aunt Zelda gasped. I just found out this summer. We all thought Moraine had died back in the 90s, but it turned out she'd run away. Must have been pregnant when she ran. Carolyn is 15, so the timing is right. Carolyn, Zelda said. I'll be damned, John said. Bring her for dinner, George said. I will, I promise, I said. Tomorrow for sure. We'll be here at four and we'll help Aunt Zelda cook. I'll be damned, John said again. Joban waited till we were back on the highway before saying what we both knew. They're hiding something, all three of them. Yep, I didn't know what else to say. I'll have to bring them in, he said. I know. And you have no idea? You don't know anything about this? Nothing, I swear. I believe you, he said, but his eyes had a skeptical look. Dr. fucking Shediak, here's to that miserable bastard. May he rest in peace. You'll be seeing them tomorrow? Yes, I said. I have to introduce them to my niece. Give it a shot, he said. You never know. Maybe they're tired of keeping secrets. That was something else we learned in major crimes. People tire of their secrets. They get weighed down, and eventually they just have to let go. I'll do my best, I said. The next day, full of Aunt Zelda's pork chops and rhubarb pie, we all sat in the parlor, Carolyn, Tilly, George, John, Zelda, and me. So, I said. Carolyn kept quiet. I'd filled her in on as much as I could guess. John was sober. That in itself was indicative of how serious the situation was. It was a long time ago, Uncle George said. Dr. fucking Shediak, Uncle John said. Now, John, Aunt Tilly said. We all stared at the fire John had built against the evening chill. Finally, George said, Mallory, do you really want to know what happened? Yes. It was a summer evening, George said, right about this time of year. Zelda was away somewhere at one of those girls' camps she was always trotting off to. Your mother, Naomi, was too wild for camp. She'd rather scamper around the countryside with me and John. She was a great kid, John added. That she was, George agreed, and so was our little brother, Harold. And Lord be praised, Naomi was so fond of him. The sun sang good morning and good night just for him, as far as she was concerned. They were closest in age of all of us, Zelda said. They were inseparable. 
I knew what it was like to be that close to a sibling. My heart broke for the thousandth time in memory of Moraine. George continued telling the story. John's buddy at the time, Guy LeBlanc, told us about a delivery that was supposed to be made late that night to the grocery store where he'd worked. He'd overheard the owner telling his son about it. Cash, he'd said, about 40000 lined up for a crooked contractor who wanted everything paid that way and wouldn't take checks. LeBlanc wanted to roll the safe, but he was afraid they'd know for sure it was him, even though they'd never given him the combination. He was good at things like that, getting past locks and such. Also, the timing was bad. He had to take his father north to Bathurst to visit his dying grandfather. His father was half-blind and couldn't drive. Guy didn't know the combination, but he was sure the safe would be easy to lift. If the three of us, John, Harold, and myself, big strapping fellows, could get it into the trunk of our car, we could hide it in our barn. When Guy got back to town, he would help us open it. Then we could bury it here at the farm. No one would ever find it. So off we go, merry as you please. But of course, Harold tells Naomi all about our plans, and she will not be left behind. You'll need a lookout, she says. And she's right. It would take the three of us to break in and cart the thing out of there. We'd need someone to watch for the cops. Let me just say, I knew nothing about this until after the fact, Zelda said. Thank God you came home when you did, Zelda, John said. We had no idea what to do. Anyway, getting back to that night, George said, we drove one of our old farm cars with the fast engine and no plates. No one in town would be likely to recognize it. We got into the supermarket all right, without using Guy's key. That would have been too obvious. We found the safe and even managed to get it out of there and onto our trunk. Naomi was driving. John and I got into the car, but Harold thought he'd dropped his cigarette pack inside the store. I've got a lot of cigs, I said. My prints will be all over the pack, Harold said. Then he scarpered back into the store. We saw him smiling at the glass doorway, waving the cigarette pack like a damn fool. That's when we heard the shout, John said. It was a cop doing his foot rounds. We froze, George said. We couldn't drive off without Harold, but he was still standing at the damn doorway, trapped like a deer in the headlights. Naomi honked the horn, and Harold came to his senses and ran for the car. I was in the front seat with Naomi, and John was in back. John left the door open for Harold. He damn nearly made it, too, but caught a bullet in the chest just before he reached the car. He didn't go down right away. John pulled him into the car, and we hauled ass out of there, burning rubber all the way. I got Naomi calmed down and reminded her to stay in the back roads and to drive at a normal speed. We took Winwood till we got to Highland View. Then we were forced to scoot over to Shediac Road. We knew Harold was in serious trouble. We remembered there was a doctor who lived nearby, just outside of Shediac proper, not far from Sandy Point. While well, we banged on that damn door for damn nearly five minutes, shouting and hollering till the old bastard finally woke up and stuck his head out the window. We knew he'd more likely open the door for a girl, so Naomi did the talking, pleading for him to help her baby brother. We even hauled Harold out of the car to show the doctor we weren't making it up. The blood was all over the place. Any fool could see he was bleeding out. But the prick wouldn't come to the door, sent us packing back to Hub City with orders to take Harold to Moncton General. We had no choice. We dragged our little brother back to the car. We weren't worried about speeding. If the cops caught us, at least they'd get Harold to the hospital lickety-split. But no one stopped us. We didn't say a word for miles. Then, somewhere near Miracle Road, John pipes up from the back seat. Harold was dead, John said. He was down on the back seat with his head on my lap. He died in my arms like an angel, without a whimper. There was no point trying to get to Moncton General. They brought him home, Zelda said. Mum and Dad didn't know what to do. They called me at camp in the morning, and I came straight away and took charge. It has to look like an accident, is what I told them. We dug the bullet out of him and laid him in the field. Dad couldn't do it to his own son, so it was left to me. 
I drove the little tractor, the one with the baling fork, and made sure it speared him just enough that the dock wouldn't look too closely. We left the handbrake off and made it seem as if the thing had rolled into Harold. They didn't question the lack of blood. After all, Harold had lain bleeding on the field for hours before we discovered him and rushed him into Moncton. That so-called doctor in Shediac never made an appearance. At least, thank God, he never filed a report either. It was put down to death by farming accident. We watched the papers for any report of a cop firing at the store that night. There was a tiny write-up. Police are asking for any information regarding a break and enter and the theft of a safe. Aunt Zelda wiped her eyes. She might be stoic, but she did have feelings. George picked up the thread where she left off. The safe, he said, was empty. Either the owner had moved the money or there never was any. Either way, we lost Harold for nothing. A few months later, your mother ran off to Toronto and took up with your father. His voice was thick with distaste for Derek Moody. Naomi couldn't stay on our old farm without her baby brother. Naomi was never the same after Harold died, Zelda said. What happened to Dr. Shediak? I asked. We tried to talk to him, but he wasn't at home, John said. We figured he must work out of Moncton General. His name was LaRue, Dr. Jean-Paul LaRue. Turns out he was a top heart surgeon. Would have been able to save our boy easily if he'd given a rat's ass. I bit my lip. It was obvious to me that LaRue had done the only thing he could under the circumstances. If caught treating a fugitive off the record, he would almost certainly have risked losing his medical license. But my uncles would never understand that. Did you talk to him? I pressed. There was a silence, but I let it build, knowing few people can resist the urge to fill a void. It was Aunt Zelda who finally spoke. Naomi, she said, averting her eyes. In fact, I couldn't help noticing the entire family was avoiding my stare. She wouldn't let it go, John said. She was closest to Harold of all of us, George said. She was crazy with grief. She said we had to talk to the doctor to let him know our brother died because of him. We tracked LaRue down at the hospital. We caught him in the parking lot at the end of his rounds. I'd had a few beers, John said. We both had, George said. Anyway, we tried to talk to LaRue. He got pissy and told us to bugger off. Next thing we know, Naomi had a tire iron in her hands. We didn't even know there was one in the car. She was out of her mind, John said. It was over in minutes. Then we had to get rid of the body, George said. I told them to take it up to Parley Beach at night, Aunt Zelda said. There was a place where the kids don't play much, shrouded behind a ridge in some bushes. I told them to go as deep as they could. My niece, Carolyn, must have been shocked by the tale. To her credit, she didn't show it. She sipped her tea, tucking her feet under her. I looked at my aging relatives, saw the pain, the obvious remorse, the grief that never goes away. I could understand the rage they'd felt against the person they held responsible for their brother's death. One day I hoped to find out what really happened to my twin, Moraine, and when I learned the truth, well, let's not draw that scene out to its conclusion. I could understand what my mother had done. I could sympathize with her desire to avenge Harold, to cut herself a big slice of revenge, even though deep down she must have known it wasn't really the doctor's fault what happened to her brother. I could understand it, but I couldn't cover it up. Secrets, in my experience, are the very imps of evil. It was time to nail this one to the gates of hell. The End And that has been Dr. Shediak by yours truly, Donna Carrick, from World Enough and Crime and North on the Yellowhead, Carrick Publishing. And now I'd like to welcome to the pod author Russell Parkway. Good morning, Russell Parkway. Welcome to Dead to Rights. How are you this morning? 
I'm doing very well, thank you. And how are you? I'm doing great. For our listeners who probably won't know this, Russell is someone who has fascinated me on social media for a number of years. Um, Russell, I've seen you do so many things, from playing the violin to writing a, a fantastic, fast-paced espionage series to, um, well, just everything, to, to speaking about issues of the day. And you fascinated me right along. I, I wanted to ask you about your Ridley Fox and Nita Paris series, which includes Pandora Successions, um, Unsavory Delicacies, and The Demeter Code. Can you tell us about that series and who your protagonists are and what they get up to? Okay, well, the series, uh, this is an espionage series, and um, it deals with two CIA operatives. One of them, actually, ironically, um, they're not American, okay, not American-born, one is actually Canadian, and the other one is from Barbados. And uh, through work, they just have to meet um, Ridley Fox, who's the male protagonist in the story. He's a former JTF-2 operative, okay, a warrant officer for actually the Joint Task Force 2, which is the Canada's version of the, of the Navy SEALs. And uh, Dr. Nita Paris, she is a... Uh, she is a scientist. She has two PhDs, one in microbiology and the other one in biochemistry. And she was formerly a weapons analyst before she became a field operative. And it was in uh, Pandora's succession, succession that they that they were reunited. They were past acquainted. And um, I'm not going to go into details of how they were past acquainted. I'll let you read the story about that. And... But it does, uh, it does yes. involve bio, a bioweapons facility in Chechnya, is that right? Yes. And it also it's carries not. them into Tokyo. So where I'm going with this is that your stories really get around the globe, and the fact that your two protagonists are from different places as well really lends a, an international flavor to your work, doesn't it? Yes. Well, this is the point, um, this, this is the point I tried to make when I was writing. I want to have um, not a homogeneous... Uh, a bunch of characters that want a more international ca- um, a more international cast of characters. And that brings story. a really good flavor from around the world and a really good perspective. Now, when you started writing this series, we'd never heard of the current political climate, but um, right, and I'm not going to get all political in this podcast or anything, but we certainly can say with some assurance that espionage fiction would be a really hot item right in the current climate, wouldn't it? Uh, with uh, For lovers of spy thrillers and action and that sort of thing. Yes, I would agree. Um, basically, all I can say is that, yes, um, some books are written before their time, and then some books are actually influenced by the times. Yes. Um, Pandora's Succession, when I first wrote it, it didn't have anything to do with politics or anything else like that. I actually was writing this when I was a youngster, um, in high school, I started writing this, and it originally was just, uh, I was mostly fascinated by, um, like, Japanese movies, like Ninjas and all that stuff there, so mm-hmm. I wanted to write a martial, I wanted to write a martial arts book, which evolved into a, a spy novel that took place in, in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the locations my stories take place, I haven't even been to, so I have to do a lot of reading and research in these areas, and... As I said, I was just um, in high school when I started writing writing the book that became, that now is Pandora's Secession. I didn't have the knowledge nor the technical experience that I have right now to know what it takes and choose in a specific location for an international thriller. I mean... Uh, and that was that I, was one of the things I was going to ask you, is how do you acquire such a global scope? Now, I know that Barbara Kingsolver, who is a hugely successful author, um, she says that imagination and research are your two greatest tools as a writer. Would you agree with that? Well, I would agree with that 120% because, yes, I do use a lot of imagination, but I do a tremendous amount of research. And the research I get, I get from the Internet, from watching the news, and sometimes I'll just be someplace and I overhear a conversation or I may just be on the subway or the metro and I see someone of a newspaper and I see the, um, the, the, the headline and bang, here comes an idea. Yeah. Now, when I was writing Pandora's Succession, 
as I said, as I was mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, um, what it was back when I was a youngster is not what it is today. When I got out of, um, when I graduated from university with a biology degree, you know, I was more open to more ideas, and that's when I. This was in the news: the Tokyo sarin gas attack. I don't know if you remember that. It was mm-hmm. perpetrated by a doomsday cult. Mm-hmm. And as soon as that um, came about, bang, another idea, and I was able to incorporate it into my story. So it, instead of a story being about ninjas, it became a, a um, story about spies in Tokyo mm-hmm. um, trying to fight, um, trying to stop a doomsday cult from unleashing this um, horrible. Micro prehistoric microorganism. Yes, yes. I, I I'm listening to your wonderfully Canadian voice, and I'm putting it. <laughs> I'm putting. I'm laying it over what I see you post online, which is so international and so broad in scope. And it's just wonderful to know that we Canadians are interested in the world at large. Like no one could mistake you for anything but Canadian. Hearing you speak, but when we see what your interests are and what you investigate and what you post about online, it's obvious that you're far more than just another Canadian, too. Um, You know, it's all part and parcel of your interest in the world that leads you to write. And that's not really a question, is it? That's a... (laughs) I'm just... um, (laughs) throwing a commentary out there. So let me be fair and go to a question. Um, Part of it is your interest in the world, but part of it is internal. Part of it's your own personal story. For example, when I was uh, researching you online, I came across the title Chill Run. And um, it just evokes a feeling of what you must have felt like when you were a Canadian track team sprinter. Um, Does your athletic background find its way into your fiction? And does it lend to your fast stories? Well, I didn't. Um, I didn't dig too much into my athletic background in in um, stories I write. However, a part of me can be found in practically all of my all of my protagonists. Like, take for example, Doctor Nita Paris. Mm-hmm. She's a former sprinter, okay, who got into an Ivy League school on a track and field scholarship. Okay, so that's as far as I went with um, track and field. Mm-hmm. Now, with um, with regards to to other things like the like my musical background, well, in Pandora's Succession, there was a scene where Ridley Fox was playing the piano, and of course, there's Eddie Barrow in mm-hmm. Chill Run. Um, yeah, Ch- Chill Run. Um, Eddie Barrow got himself into a whole bunch of trouble. And he's a struggle. He was a struggling author, and I think we've all been there. Yes, struggling author can't get um, a, can't get a book deal, and as a result, he he hit a he was at a low point of his life. He had hit hit um, lower than rock bottom, if you can believe that. And it was a situation where he felt that he was he had nothing left to lose and everything to gain, and he took a huge risk in this ridiculous. Um, Publicity stunt with his friends that in the end ended up getting some uh, someone killed. I loved <laughs> it. I loved the storyline. I loved the premise of it. Um, in fact, when I was reading about Chill Run, I was I was laughing out loud because you hit on it. If you're an author, chances are very good that you're a struggling author. So you'll relate to Chill Run with its story about the starving author Eddie Barrow Jr. Um, it's just it just sounds like you know the kind of way that. He could get quite into trouble. He he seeks help from two unlikely friends, an alcoholic and a dominatrix. Well, that kind of says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Are you aware of any other ways in which your own personal history finds its way into your fiction? You've already started to answer that, I think, with um, the musical background and the athletic background and the the background as a writer. Um, It's something that I'm always fascinated about. Um, And when I'm talking about chill run and fast-paced stories, I'm not just lending towards the fact that uh, one of your characters was a track runner, but also the fact that that kind of need for speed kind of is pervasive throughout all your stories. There's um, a ticking clock in all your stories, isn't there? Well, that's um, I I never thought of it that way, but now that you mention it, I would have to say yes. Okay, uh, my life has always been has always revolved around speed. 
I'm not someone who likes to wait on people. I have to get things done now, okay, not later. I'm not someone who likes to procrastinate. I definitely don't like it when others procrastinate on me. But, um, yes, I have to say that my stories have always been fast-paced. Um, I was... I remember after writing Pandora Succession, there was some criticism that it was too fast-paced, if you can believe that, and mm-hmm. this and that. And, but anyways, you know, I've learned over I've learned over time not to not to listen to not to listen to every single critic because the thing is is that not everyone's going to agree with what you write. There's going to be some people who like what you write. There are people who are not going to like what you write. So don't try to write someone with the goal of trying to please everybody. Yes, um, yes. A number of our authors have made this case that if you write for yourself, you uh-huh. will have a an appreciative audience. Um, and and it will come through to the rest of your readers that, that you're carrying some authority in your words. And if I was going to throw a tip for writers out, I would say... You can be right in this world or you can be wrong. But if you write with authority, with a sense of authority, people will respond well to what you're writing. And um, you won't be able to write with that sense of authority if you're too finely attuned to every critic out there. No, exactly. Well, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, um, I can't agree with you more on that part there. I say, look, um, whenever someone comes up to me and says, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And I said, well, first of all, I'm writing for myself first, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not writing for every single person. I write in my genre. I write what I enjoy. And that's what I tell people. Look, don't let anybody else tell you what to write. You mm-hmm. write for yourself first. You write what you enjoy. Mm-hmm. You, write what you, in, you, you write what you're knowledgeable about, okay? And, you know, um, those who don't like it, well, look, you know, I'm sure they'll find someone else to read that they will like. Okay? I wonder if but this is per- have- yeah. I wonder if this is pervasive in every art, Russell, because um, I know as a writer, I've encountered this time and time again, and every writer I've talked to has mentioned it. I cannot count the number of people who have come to me and said, "Oh, you should. You're a writer. You should write about this, that, or the other thing." <laughs> well, why? Why wouldn't you go write that if that's an interest of yours? You know. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Um, like many artistic people, you've got more than one outlet for your sense of creativity. Um, I know that many of our listeners might not have encountered your violin playing online. I encourage them to find you on Facebook under Russell Parkway and look for your videos of yourself playing the violin because you are brilliant. It's just such a joy every time I tune into one of your one of your pieces. Um, so if anyone has not heard Russell playing the violin, please go find a video and uh, delight in the music. When did you first uncover your love of music? How long have you been playing? And do you play any other instruments? And what drew you to the violin? There's a fourfold question for you. Yeah, well, um, all I can say is that um, my love for music, well, I just remember my mother, she once told me that my love for music goes back as far as back um, when I was a toddler. I was always humming or singing along with tunes I'd hear on the radio or anything that she would play on the stereo. Yes, we had stereos back then. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, in fact, I remember my first favorite song was Candy Girl by New Edition. And I was, how old was I? I was... I was I was I was a toddler back then. Um, I was fresh out of diapers at that time. There, I remember. And you know, whenever that song would come on, I'd have to stop whatever I was doing, and I'd have to get up and sing along with it. Wherever I was in the house, no matter what I was doing, I'd have to stop and I'd have to sing along with it. I didn't know the words, but I know the tune. So I'd just be singing gibberish most of the time, and until I came to the the chorus, "Candy Girls," all I want, you know. And however. I was into the violin, and my parents got me into private lessons. I was playing since I was around, around five years old. That's when I got okay. my first violin. So we and can thank your parents, if not for giving you a love of music, for at least fostering your love of music and encouraging it, and having music in the home, which is so important, isn't it? Well, yes, uh, that's something I have to credit my parents for. Now, where do you see our book industry going next? That's something that I want to talk with uh, as many people about as I can. Um, it's it's quite an industry. It's been really on a roller coaster the last couple of years with books, e-books, audio books. Um, 
What tips can you offer to people on what forums to use and how best to engage with readers? Well, I always um, I always say you do what you're comfortable with, okay? If um, you want to do an audio book and not write, then I would say do an audio book, okay? Um, if you're going to write a book, yes, it's um, important to have it in paperback, but you have to embrace the reality that e-books are becoming more and more popular. But the most important thing, and I mean, um, uh, New York Times best-selling author Joseph Stender once told me this uh, several years ago. Um, I mean, back in the days of MySpace, he told me, Russell, never stop writing. I mean, that's the only, that's the best way to improve. Mm-hmm. Okay. And in terms of um, seeing where the industry is going, I can say that the book industry is in comp. It still is, and it's not in. More competition, and yeah, more competition with the with the TV and the movie industry. Mm-hmm. It seems that nowadays, with um, social media, people's attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. They just seem to be not evolving, but devolving. Okay, mm-hmm. and um, writers have to find a way to write in such a way to keep readers engaged. Mm -hmm. And that would mean shorter chapters. It would mean the rise of novellas, which never used to be all that popular, but they certainly rose. They rose to great heights with, um, with works like the Hunger Games series. Yes. You know, um, the novella has just had a real field day recently, and I, I do attribute that to shorter attention spans, faster paced action, get that page turning, you know. Anyways, Russell, it's been fantastic having you on Dead to Rights. I really want to thank you for joining us. Um, You've given us an awful lot to think about, and I hope everybody will come and find your books now. I've got to say something. You don't write as Russell Parkway. Tell our listeners your writing name. My name is Russell Brooks. That's actually the name that's on my birth certificate. (laughs) Okay, okay, so you do, you write as Russell Brooks, very easy to find on Amazon. What's your website? My website is russellparkway.com. Okay, so you're looking for russellparkway.com, and uh, your Twitter handle, if you don't mind? It's no other Russell. No other Russell, there we go. (laughs) And there is no other Russell. I've enjoyed your online persona for years, Russell. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. Let it rot. I want to thank Russell Parkway, who writes as Russell Brooks, for joining us today on Dead to Rights, the podcast. You can find Dead to Rights at deadtorights.ca or at our Facebook page. Our Twitter handle is at Dead to Rights Pod. We'd love to hear from you at Carrick Publishing or at our Carrick Publishing Facebook page. You can find me, Donna Carrick, on Twitter at Donna underscore Carrick or at my website, DonnaCarrick.com. Join us next week when it will be our pleasure to bring you an interview with Conversations Live host, Mr. Cyrus Webb. Our Dead to Rights theme song is Eyes of Gold, composed and performed by Ted Carrick, who also brought all original story scoring music. Thanks for joining us on Dead to Rights. See you next week. Dusty road, a man alone. His vital signs go on hold. And I don't know what you've been told. But the years have turned my eyes gold. And I told you what you told me. We'd never be in the same boat for free, yet it rides, let it ride.